If you're looking for proven ways to take your fundraising results to the next level, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast, hosted by Tammy Zonker. Tammy has trained and led thousands of nonprofit organizations to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars and is also recognized as one of America's top 20 fundraising experts. This is the podcast where Tammy equips and empowers amazing fundraising pros like you to transform your fundraising so you can transform the world. And now, let's hear from Tammy. Today, I'm excited to talk with Steve Johns. Steve is the CEO of One Cause, a fundraising software company helping nonprofits build better tomorrows. He brings over 30 years of experience in technology, corporate development, venture capital, event production, and entrepreneurship to his role. When he's not leading fearlessly, you can find him jamming to his classic rock tunes, walking the sands of Cocoa Beach with his family, or cheering for his beloved Chicago White Sox. That tells me a lot about you, Steve. <laughs> I, I had the pleasure of hearing Steve speak at the Rays conference hosted by One Cause in Nashville a few weeks ago. And it's a really great conference. Of all the conferences I speak at, Rays was one of the most organized mm -hmm. conferences with expertly curated content for everything event and online fundraising and way more. So be sure to check it out in 2024 when it comes around again. No doubt. Steve. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here and I appreciate the good word on Rays. I, I can't say enough about the team that puts that together. They are absolutely incredible and it is a really great conference. And we're looking forward to bringing that back in 2024. Awesome. Yeah, it was a privilege to be a part of it this year. Today, I want to talk about your new book, Steve. It's called Fearless Leadership Lessons at the Crossroads. Now, for our listeners, I'll share the summary description of Fearless. You write, organizations of all shapes and sizes face change from growth expectations to external pressures that force evolution. But what happens when change is cataclysmic, altering your world overnight? Enter the leader, the one who guides through chaos. They may not see the future, but there's one thing they do know, stopping, hiding, Hoping for a different outcome is not an option. Too much is at stake. They must lead onward with a full heart that only a fearless leader has. Talk to us about that, Steve. We've all been through a lot of change. There's been a lot of, a lot of things going on, the pandemic, and then it seems like one thing after another. Why did you write Fearless? So first of all, I just wanted to comment on what you just said, because that's what I was thinking and feeling as you were reading that as well, Tammy. It's just like, it, it started in March of 2020, but I don't think it stopped there. We've just moved from one crisis into another, and it's moved from being a pandemic to economic issue and general geopolitical unrest. And it just feels like we've gone from issue to issue. So thank you again for setting the stage there because we're still in this. We're not out of yeah. anything. I will say this. I did not start out to write a book. I'm calling myself the accidental author. And so in the beginning of the pandemic, we were making lots of changes to the business. And I, I talk about putting our mask on first. And so we had to make changes to the business to make sure that we were going to be there for our customers so that we could really kind of bolster ourselves from a financial perspective first. And then we set about the task of going and helping our nonprofit customers continue to successfully fundraise. And so things were changing and I wanted to communicate on a regular basis what was happening in the business. And so I sat down and I committed to the company to write a weekly update. And so I wrote my first weekly update in the beginning of April of 2020 and continued to write these weekly updates week after week through all of 20 and all of 21. And then in the summer of 2021, my marketing team came to me with a gift. We have an annual all company event. And it was a spiral bound notebook of all of my weekly updates. And, you know, we laughed, we cried a little bit when we saw kind of what we all had been through. And then we started to look at each other and say, you know, there might be the beginnings of a book here. And so the book is really kind of a, a compilation of the weekly updates that I sent to the company in 20 and 21. 
We spent the summer of 2022 putting them together, writing introductions. And then the final thing that we did was we pulled out what we're calling these leadership lessons. And so at the end of every chapter, we've summarized three to four leadership lessons. And so if you really want to too long, don't read this, TLDR this, go to the end of each chapter, you'll find three or four leadership lessons. And there's about 50 leadership lessons that we learned during the pandemic. And the one thing that I want to add before I close that story is that while these leadership lessons were learned and perhaps experienced and re relearned by us during the pandemic, they are applicable today. And you don't need a crisis to apply leadership lessons like being adaptable and being honest and, and having good communications. And so I feel that this is something of a reference book too, in terms of all of the things that we're facing, even on a day-to-day -day basis as we face these crossroads every day. Amazing. And I can just picture and imagine how it felt to be presented with the, the culmination, like the, all of those emails at that company-wide event. Incredible. It's, it's moving. It's moving. It's moving. When I just even I sit down and re read the first couple of chapters of, of the book today, it, it puts me back in that place where we had planned maybe over 2,000 in-person fundraisers that had to be converted to online and virtual in, in the course of literally overnight. What was the impact of those weekly emails on your team as the pandemic unfolded? When I made the commitment, I didn't know how long I was going to be writing these. Right? So I was including financial and operational metrics that I didn't include in the book because they were confidential. And then what I did is I just started opening up. And at first, I was pretty clinical, maybe I'd say, in terms of how we were doing and, and how we were coming back. But then I felt like I had to be more inspirational. And I started finding stories about overcoming adversity and showing resilience. And I got inspiration from my morning. I, I have a morning ritual where I, I do some meditation, I do some light workouts, and I listen to this app called the Calm app. And it provided me inspiration that I wanted to bring to the company as well. So I think people started to look for this every week. They started to look for the inspiration. And again, remember, we were all sent home. And in a minute, 120 people in Indianapolis went home. We were already distributed across the country. And it became a link. It became a tether to bind us together as we dealt with all the issues that were facing us from a business standpoint. But, you know, we were facing these issues personally as well. We had people who had kids coming home to learn. And, and all of a sudden, you're in an apartment or a home that you intended to be your apartment or home for kind of after work and after school. And all of a sudden it became the place where you had to work, teach, learn, play, et cetera. It just was a completely different dynamic. And again, I think these weekly updates help people to know that they weren't alone out there. And then we were all engaged in the shared experience. Yeah. You're bringing back so many memories, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> I hope some good. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yes. But even just how I feel like I started very naively, you know, right. at the time I, I was chief philanthropy officer at the Children's Center in Detroit and we had a team of maybe 10 people. And I remember we called a meeting, we pulled chairs in a circle and I said, listen, I need you to pack up things that you're going to need to work on for the next two or three weeks. Right. We're going to work know. remotely for a couple of weeks until this thing passes a couple of weeks, of course, as we know, turned into years. And, yeah. and I think that those communications initially were very practical, you know, the how to's, the what's going on, the putting in structures for communication that didn't exist before because we had face to face meetings and we sat next to each other and in cubicles. But I love how. You just had a pulse on your team and you intuitively knew they needed inspiration in addition to logistics or company information about how the business was going. And Tammy, I, I think that was also part of allowing myself to feel the same thing, this, that vulnerability that I talk about. And so I think what I was trying to do is I was trying to give people what I was also needing and feeling. And again, it was at that point in time where I had to step up and say, I need to be the one who is sending that message. I think I became characterized as, as saying something to the effect of, I don't have all of the answers. 
And if I mm -hmm. sat here and I said that I had all of the answers, you know that I was not being honest. And so let's focus from a point of honesty here. I don't have all the answers, but I, I will tell you this. I will commit to you that if we work together, we'll figure it out. We'll get through it. I don't know how, but we're going to figure it out. And I think that became like the main theme and the rallying point. And then it was just lessons like time management and finding what I call the silver lining mindset is, is just looking for those silver linings and some of the bad news that we were getting every day. And I have to admit, I, and, and it's probably in the book or it's at least in one of my updates where I said, when we all get back together in July, you know, <laughs> I had no idea. Well, that is a great segue into the main theme. The main theme of this book is authentic, fearless leadership. So let, let's start talking about what does that mean? You know, what does right. authentic, fearless leadership look like in the day-to-day -day operations of any organization, but specifically a nonprofit? True, true. What I'll start with on that is what does it mean to be fearless? And so my definition of fearless, and maybe it's a literal definition of fearless, I'm not sure, but it's being willing to, to move forward and take action in the face of great unknowns and uncertainties. And so you know, you could call that courage, you could call that being brave, but I really like the word fearless. And, and so can you think of another time where there were so many unknowns and we could have been paralyzed with fear, we could have been frozen with fear. And so I think that being fearless is knowing that the future is undetermined and we don't have all of the answers, but it's also being willing to move forward and take action. And so again, I, I saw myself Really, it was my role to kind of set the tone for that. So then we got to make a plan too. It's not that I didn't have the answers, but I did have a plan. And so let's put a plan together uh, and move forward and execute that plan. And then again, look for those silver linings. Then comes authenticity, right? And so in order to be authentic, you have to be true to yourself. And I would say in nonprofits, as well as at one cost, being true to yourself also includes being true to your mission and being true to the values that you established. And one cause had just established our values. And I became infamous for saying things like, these can't just be something that we put on a coffee mug and they can't just be something that we put on a t-shirt or a poster in the break room. And then we didn't have the luxury of any of that. We didn't have coffee mugs, t-shirts or a break room. And so my weekly updates also had to be the way that I continue to reinforce the values, remind people of the values, and really take those values together with the weekly updates and create that culture that it's really difficult to have culture in, and to grow culture in, and reinforce that when everyone is working from home. And so again, I'd say that nonprofits were feeling that as well. So what you have to do is you have to connect back to the mission and stay true to the mission and be authentic to the mission as you move forward in, in your daily and periodic fundraising activities. And so again, when I say authentic, so you don't know if you're true to yourself until you state what you believe. And so I'm a big believer in literally like putting uh, the words I believe on the top of a piece of paper and writing, what do you believe in? What do you stand for? And, and I'm going to quote a, a, a Hoosier, John Mellencamp, who says something like, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And so I'd say that we all have to decide what it is that we believe in, set the value, set the mission, and stay true to that. I think that's authenticity. That's the authentic piece of being fearless. Yeah, I love that. Props for calling out John Mellencamp or Johnny Cougar, as those of us who go back a little Johnny further Cougar. remember him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steve, you wrote that, I'm going to quote you, going back to the office no longer seemed like the natural goal it had once been. We were given a once in a lifetime opportunity to re-examine the way we worked from the ground up. And, you know, we don't need a crisis to re-examine and to decide what should the future look like? What's the ideal scenario? What do we want to create? Right. And yet that kind of important work never really feels urgent unless there is a crisis. So I feel like our sector like we have our fair share of challenges around some of the things that you've talked about so far. Like, yes, we're very mission focused, but sometimes building and sustaining culture and identifying our core values, like what do we really believe in good times and tough times? Here in the U.S., of course, we've had historically high turnover in fundraising positions. We can say we believe in our people, but 
our behaviors aren't necessarily producing results that demonstrate that. So high fundraising position turnover, vacant positions. Mm -hmm. Even now, most of the clients I work with have vacant positions they're working to fill. And many of the challenges there are that fundraisers are leaving the profession. And, you know, that breaks my heart. And I'm sure it breaks your heart a bit too. Remote and hybrid work environments. There's just still a lot going on. So how do leaders create a thriving workplace culture where people want to stay, especially when they aren't necessarily in the same space? Or perhaps how do they build trust when they've never met in person? Those are some pretty, pretty heavy issues. Let me just maybe draw upon my own experience and, and, and maybe try and, and again, apply that in, in the nonprofit world. I believe that we all seek open, frequent transparent communication. I, I think that, and, and, and I, I guess what I would add to that is also being proactive. It's like, don't wait for someone to say, hey, we haven't heard from you in a while. Can you tell us what's going on? How are we doing relative to our goals? Our, how are we doing relative to um, our, our fundraising objectives and, and the budget? And do we have enough money for next year? And so as a leader, I really truly believe that frequent open, transparent communication is going to help with a lot of that. Again, we have people leaving jobs to make more money um, as well. And as I say, you can almost always leave a job for 10% more or maybe even a little bit more than that. But again, I think that we do have people that we call boomerangs who end up coming back and realizing that the grass isn't always greener somewhere else. And so I do believe that if you create that culture, if you share your vision, if you engage in frequent and and transparent communication, then it's all out in the open. And I think that helps to, with that retention, I think that helps with people understanding the, where they fit in the organization. I think that's the other thing. We had this a little bit when I first joined the company and we've changed and we've created the series of OKRs or objectives and key results so that you know that the question or the issue was, I don't know how what I'm working on every day fits into the overall goal and strategy of the organization or the business. That's a miss. If that's what people are feeling, you're going to have people leaving the company because they don't know that they're having um, an impact. Now think about the impact that one cause has. We support 6,200 nonprofit organizations. We're going to help those organizations raise over a billion dollars this year wow. in, in fundraising on our software platform. That is massive. That is huge. I'm actually now back to writing an update. It's monthly, not weekly, but I found that I was needing to communicate more. And the the theme of my last communication was exponential impact, the exponential impact that we, that you uh, as a person who's, whether you're building, uh, selling, marketing, supporting, whatever our product with these nonprofit organizations and the causes that they serve, we have the Ability, we get to have this exponential Im- impact. And it, it really helps and it really goes a long way. I think that people, I know that I've seen studies in the past where young professionals were willing to give up some salary in exchange for purpose and mission and a sense of doing good and, and making an impact. And so I believe in that. I don't want people giving up income, but I believe that you need to start with providing something that creates impact and, and has mission. And, and that's what I was seeking as well. That's, what, that's why I joined the company back in 2014. I love that. And I completely agree with you. I think that the people that we attract, whether we are a nonprofit or we're serving the nonprofit community, right. they are purpose-driven. They yes. are mission-driven. They want to make a difference. And so I think it's just so necessary and brilliant that you're focusing on helping people understand what their role is in the overall ecosystem of what you're creating and providing. And I also agree that the research, the studies, and even just conversations confirm that people aren't necessarily leaving just for the money. It's about having purpose, enjoying the culture, feeling respected and appreciated, and flexible work hours, flexible work time. You talk about silver linings, Steve, which I absolutely love. I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic was that that lived experience equipped organizations to see 
gosh, I don't have to have every employee in the office where I can see them and inspect and make certain they're not yes. working because they are working. I'm sorry. It's just, no, you, you just struck a chord because I was definitely the person who was not in favor of that. And so if you rewind this all the way to 2019, there was definitely requests that were coming in for almost, from almost every part of the organization hey, should we have Friday work from home day or is there some sort of flexibility? And I have to admit, I was thinking old school back then. No, how are we going to know that the productivity goals are being met and how are we going to know? And I want everybody here, you know, all day. And it really taught us new tricks. It really taught us that we can get that balance. And, and I loved your last question because you talked about going back and like what I'm trying to be purposeful about when I talk about it is moving forward. And so when I, I try not to ever use the words, we're going back to the office. I always tried to use the words, we're going forward to the future of work. And forward to the future of work includes this natural notion of, of hybrid. We were kind of half of our company was already distributed to begin with, but now more than half of Indianapolis is distributed as well. And we have teams that come in Mondays and Wednesdays or teams that come in on Thursdays and Fridays. And at no time have I ever said, everyone has to be back to the office, or, or even I wish that people would come back to the office. What we wanted to do is we wanted to create an office setting in an environment that was desirable, that, that people wanted to come in, that we have open spaces and that we are welcoming. And when you come in, you come in for the right reasons. You don't come in to do heads down work. You come in to do collaboration and teamwork and mentoring and all of the things that can't be done when your head's down at home. And then go to heads down at home and get your work done. But when you come into the office, it's about collaboration and teamwork and, and learning from each other and also experiencing those great collisions that are happening. We literally have a well, water cooler and a coffee room and those collisions are happening. And, and people are saying, gosh, you know, that conversation wouldn't have happened if I wouldn't have been here today. It would have been, OK, are you available for a Zoom call? When are you available? And uh, what time zone are you in? And we, there's so much administration that goes into setting up that communication where I'm just waiting for a cup of coffee or I'm just going to get a glass of water. And in a course of three minutes, we were able to talk about something, resolve something and move it forward in a way that um, you can't do it remote. So there are advantages to being remote and there are advantages to being in person, and we're hoping that we're uh, taking advantage of, of both. I love it. I think it, overall, it's working. I think it will be fascinating to yes. see the turnover Studies. rate <laughs> yeah. long term. I cannot I wait to see. <laughs> You're right. So, Steve, if you could share one piece of leadership advice for nonprofit executive directors or CEOs or even fundraisers. So many of our listeners are fundraisers or they wear multiple hats, fundraising and marketing and executive director. What would that advice be and why? I would say we've already talked about engaging in frequent, transparent communication. I'd say that would be probably my number one lesson. And, and I, I learned that as well. And so if I, let me go deeper than that. Maybe I'll pull out something else that I really like to talk about. And I call it kind of like, almost kind of the secret to life or the secret to happiness. And this is a lesson that I've included in my book. It's a lesson that I'm retelling. It's a, a, a lesson that's been learned, but I will re revisit it for purposes of our audience here. And that is basically it's it, this stoic philosophy of it doesn't matter what happens to you, but how you react to it that matters. Or don't wring your hands and fret about the things that are outside of your control. Focus instead on those things that are in your control, and that's how you react and respond to the situation. So we learned that during the pandemic. There was a lot of hand-wringing going, how did this pandemic happen, or I wish it didn't happen? It doesn't matter. It did happen. Now what matters is what you do about it next. So move on and don't worry about it. And same with the economy today, we're wringing our hands a little bit that giving was down in 2022. Giving was still half a trillion dollars in total in the United States in 2022. So let's focus on the things that we can control, and that's how we react and respond to that. 
So I would say build deeper relationships with the donors that you have. So if new donors are finding it more difficult to give, make sure that you cultivate those relationships with your existing donors. And just think about it like a company like, like One Cause. It costs probably six or eight times more for us to acquire a new customer than it does to retain an existing one. So really go deep with your existing donors, learn about them, use data and analytics. Yes, use artificial intelligence to learn more about them and, and reach them in more effective and efficient ways and cultivate those relationships and, and keep them. Let's not settle for 70 or 80% attrition or, or churn on first year donors. We need to embrace them, pull them in and build those relationships. So again, don't focus on the things outside of your control, inflation, interest rates, fears of recession, gyrations in the stock market. Focus on how, what you can control, and that's what, how you react and respond and how you build those relationships with donors and cultivate those donors and keep them. And then we'll deal with getting new ones after that. I got to give you a big amen on that one. <laughs> I am, am absolutely a believer in just focus on people, focus on relationships. Right. Tell the story, what you do, why it matters, what difference it's making, what would happen if you went away and the good things will happen. Right. No doubt about it. Right, right. And again, it's reinforcing that. And then, you know, we talk about impact a lot. And so, you know, we have a social donor study that we did and we have the acronym of time and it's trust, impact, mission, and ease. So are you doing enough to build trust as an organization? Are you showing the impact that the donor dollars are having? Are you connecting and making sure that the donor is connecting with the mission? And then finally, are you making the giving experience easy? If you can think about time, you think about those aspects of fundraising, that's what we have seen in our studies, will keep donors coming back as long as you focus on those four primary aspects of generosity. Love it. Absolutely love it. So Steve, over your shoulder, you can I see an image of the yes. cover of your book with the lotus flower yes. on it. The lotus flower plays a role in the book. Can you talk about the significance of it? So it actually represented a, a, a turning point in the way that I was writing my weekly updates. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hearken back to the call map that I mentioned earlier. And one morning I was on my mat and doing some morning meditation. And this, the story came on, and it's a story that's been told, but it's the story of the lotus bud that works its way through the muck and the mud and the mire of the pond, and that the bud represents its potential. And it ultimately makes its way to the surface and emerges as this beautiful white lotus flower. And the, the, the lotus flower is a symbol of beauty and resilience, and, but only through the struggle through the mud and the muck and the mire, the bud emerges as this beautiful white flower. And I, I literally went, wow, this is the yeah. story of one cause. This is the story of the pandemic. This is the story of our nonprofit customers. We are so deep in the mud right now. We are this bud that is just working its way through the mud and the muck and the mire of the pond. If we looked up, we could not even see the sun because it was so dark. But I wanted to also tell the story to my team to say that there's hope and we can emerge as this beautiful white flower on the top of the pond and we will be better off for the journey. And so that I told that story and that really resonated and was really well accepted. And so I began to search for that type of symbolism and quotes and again, just really searching for inspiration of this fighting through the adversity and showing resilience in the face of everything that we were going through and then hoping we can sh also share those stories with our customers and, and our customers taught us. Then I started to include customer success stories and oh my gosh, it was so amazing to see the, the creative ways in which our fundraising software was being used in the pandemic. And remember, we were primarily an event fundraising in-person solution. and we went 100% virtual and online and our customers had to go all online. And, and again, just the creativity that was shown with um, using the, 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 the technology in, a, in an online and virtual sense was incredibly in, inspiring as well. So 
again, I think that story became kind of really the turning point and became the symbol that we're using now to, to, as you said, on the front of the book. And fun thing about having a a reference point, we were able to now talk about it a lot in our day-to-day and how you know, well, well, you know, maybe we might be in the muck and the mud and the mire right now. Let's let's focus on becoming that beautiful white lotus plant or that the, uh, the lotus flower, Steve, and so that we can someday emerge. I love that so much. I think sometimes we do get so caught mm. up in the muck and the mire and we forget who we are and what we're up to and who we are for one another as colleagues. It's beautiful. And I love that it has become the symbol for your organization for one cause, not just a beautiful cover on a book. It's very meaningful. Yeah, I love it. Well, if you've enjoyed today's conversation and the incredible insights that Steve has shared, just know that this book has even more insights, advice, and wisdom. At the end of each episode, I like to ask a few rapid fire insightful questions to provide even more value to our listeners. Steve, are you game for some rapid fire questions? Sure. <laughs> All right, here we go. First one, what's the best leadership advice you've ever received? Okay, so I have to be rapid fire here. I guess what I'll do is I'll give you a leadership quote that I, I really like and I, I reference a lot. And that is great leaders inspire others to lead. And that's the way that I try to look at leadership. And so when I evaluate my actions, I try to ask myself, am I inspiring others to lead? I'm not even saying, am I inspiring others to follow me? I want to inspire others to lead. And again, I reference in the book that leadership isn't just about being a CEO. Everyone has the capacity and almost a responsibility to be a leader, whether you're, again, whether you're marketing, sales, engineering, product development, support, everyone has the capacity to lead. Love it. What book do you recommend to our audience and why? That's a small book called The Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's like an hour read, but it's a handbook. I probably have read it 20 times. <laughs> it's something of a guide map for how you live your life. And it starts with things like being in- impeccable with your word. And I believe it provides inspiration for how you should act, how you should treat others. And really at the end of the day, it's the last agreement is always do your best. And I feel very strongly about that as well. So I'll say the four agreements. Love that book. What are the three most important traits a successful leader must possess? Uh, so I'm going to start with vulnerability. Don't be afraid to be vulnerable. I think vulnerability starts with from a position of strength. I think that you have to be strong. Um, vulner- vulnerability sometimes is, 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 is associated with weakness. I would say it's, a, it's strength. Communicate clearly, effectively, transparently. Uh, don't forget that. And I guess earn it every day. Uh, you keep working on it. Leadership isn't a right. It's not a title. It's what you should earn, earn every day. I love that. And I've never heard it put that way, but I completely agree. Awesome. What's your favorite fundraising application or tool? And Are you okay really asking me that, cause. Tammy? It's okay. <laughs> you can say it. I love one cause. <laughs> I love One Cause. We're doing great things. We have a new fundraising platform that we released about a year ago. We do auctions, we do runs and walks and rides, and we're also providing online fundraising and text to give. So I'm going to go ahead and plug One Cause. Do it. It's a really (laughs) amazing, (laughs) robust tool, and and you can be shameless. Thank you. Here's another opportunity for shamelessness. What's your favorite conference and why? (laughs) I'm going to say Ray's. And this is true. Like I would say Raise, even if I wasn't the presenting sponsor of Raise uh, as a CEO of One Cause. It's an amazing opportunity for fundraising professionals. This is where we came up with the word fearless. Fearless fundraisers coming together, sharing best practices, sharing ideas, learning from each other, getting inspiration from each other, and knowing that you're not alone out there. And it's a couple of days of camaraderie and friendship and learning. And I just... This year was so special, and I look forward to 2024. I'll also say that the NEO conference that Next After does is pretty good as well. So I will, but I will, I will put Ray's at the top. Very good. Last question. Knowing what you know now about fundraising and leadership, what advice would you give your younger self just getting started in this profession? Uh, okay. So the advice that I would give my younger self is to be more patient. And I say that because I'm trying to give that advice to, to young professionals here, as well as my kids. As you can see, I'm at the later stage of my career. And early in my career, I 
think that I'd consider it to be a series of sprints or a sprint. And we're in a long distance event here. And so I would say to young professionals just getting started, whether you're in a technology company supporting nonprofits or whether you're in a nonprofit, be patient, give yourself some grace. It is a long distance event. It is not a sprint. Thank you for joining us, Steve. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. If you want to learn more about Steve, One Cause, or connect with him on LinkedIn, we've included links in the show notes, as well as links to his book, Fearless, Leadership Lessons at the Crossroads, and the other resources that we've talked about today. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Intentional Fundraiser Podcast. Keep on transforming your fundraising so you can transform the world. The Intentional Fundraiser Podcast is a Fundraising Transformed original. It's hosted by me, Tammy Zonker, founder and president of Fundraising Transformed, where we help equip and empower fundraisers, nonprofit leaders, and board members to transform their fundraising so they can transform the world. Visit fundraisingtransform.com slash podcast to subscribe to this podcast and subscribe to my newsletter to get fundraising lessons, tools, and helpful resources delivered straight to your inbox each month. If you want my help with taking your fundraising to the next level, become a member of my Fundraising Transformers community as a growth member and join me live each month where I'll teach you the same strategies I use to lead, train, and coach thousands of nonprofits, social service organizations, healthcare foundations, private schools, colleges, and universities to collectively raise more than a half billion dollars including a single gift of $27.1 million. As a member, you can participate in my Ask Me Anything sessions every month and get answers to your burning questions. Chat with other growth members inside our private and safe online community about what you're working on, struggling with, and share lessons learned. And get instant access to my growing library of on-demand self-paced training classes. New content is added every single month. Learn more about becoming a member at fundraisingtransform.com slash growth. Talk soon.